Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, it is my total uh, pleasure and honor to introduce my very dear friend, Susan Minot, today. Um, Susan and I met uh, so long ago um, when I was a little girl, and she was just a little older. One of the, uh, right here on this island, one of the beautiful and kind and clever teenage girls who was friends with my sisters and whom I idolized. And then the age gap got smaller as we got older. <laughs> And we became great friends. And we have written together in many island spots over the years. Uh, we've written in Vineyard Haven in the off season. We've written in my house in Chilmark here in the summer. One lucky winter in Tortola. And we have spent a lot of time together on the island of Manhattan. Um, one night, many, many years ago, Susan and I were invited to a dinner party. Um, where uh, a friend of ours who um, was involved with Human Rights Watch had invited um, a Ugandan woman who came and had dinner with us and spoke to us about her experiences uh, in Uganda and um, the group of girls who had been abducted from the school at which her, um, at her daughter was one of these young women who had been abducted. And um, I think Susan and I were both very moved and devastated by this woman's story. And uh, I went home, and like many people, when one hears stories like this and feel helpless, I went home and tried to forget about it. And Susan went home and started making notes for this extraordinary novel she's written, 30 Girls. Um, in the New York Times, Fia Matarocco calls says of 30 Girls, Susan Minot takes huge questions and examines them with both a delicate touch and clear-eyed, unyielding scrutiny. Susan is an award-winning novelist and short story writer. She is the author of Monkeys, Folly, Lust, and Other Stories, Poems 4 AM, Rapture, and Evening, which was adapted into the feature film of the same name starring Meryl Streep. Minot also wrote the screenplay of Bernardo Bertolucci's Stealing Beauty. Her most recent book is 30 Girls. Minot was born in Boston and currently lives with her daughter, dividing her time between New York City, where she teaches, and an island off the coast of Maine. And we are so glad to have her on our island. Welcome, Susan Minot. Thank you very much, dear, dear Al. Um, very happy to be here. I've uh, Martha's Vineyard is uh, um, one of my favorite islands. Maybe not my most favorite, but my second favorite island. Um, I'm going to talk about um, how I came to write this book, which Al has given you um, a little bit of. Uh, uh, slant on, and then I'm going to read a, a very little bit, because I think it's hard on a <clears throat> beautiful, sunny Sunday morning to listen to someone sort of read, but, um, and then I'll answer some questions if you have any about this book. So um, how did I come to write a story set in East Africa um, about uh, partly um, a situation that I had no um, deep connection to. Um, the answer is, as, as Al has said, I went to a dinner party. And I could have easily not gone to that dinner party, but I went and there were some people from Human Rights Watch. There was going to be the, their banquet the next day um, and they were honoring um, this woman whose name is Angelina Item. And at the end of dinner, there were probably about a dozen of us. Um, someone said, here's our friend Angelina. She's come from Uganda. And she told the story of um, a group of bandits um, called the Lord's Resistance Army who attacked a boarding school of girls in northern Uganda run by Italian nuns which was all a very interesting combination of things, something I had not um, heard of. 
and led a lot of a whole dormitory full of these girls into the bush to enslave them as soldiers, as wives, um, to as Joseph Coney, the leader of the LRA, would put it to um, expand my family. Um, one of the nuns at this school called St. Mary's of Aboke, um, at dawn realized that the children had been taken, a, a, a window had been pulled out from the dormitory. They chipped away out of the concrete and then they used it as a ladder to, to take these girls, said, I'm going to go and, and bring my girls back. So she went off and sure enough, in the middle of the next day, she caught up with them in this, you know, unmapped area, um, very poor area of northern Uganda, which is mostly farming, and um, saw the girls across this valley, all lined up, tied up with ropes, with a group of probably 40 rebels, as they're called, um, and caught up with them and um, saw that sort of commander standing there. And I'm not going to tell you the whole story because I wrote the fictionalized version of that, and that's what I'm going to read. But at the end of this, this, this tale, this woman named Angelina was telling us, she said, um, someone said, well, do we know about this? <laughs> Which was a, a uh, sympathetic question to ask, but it obviously answered itself. No one did know about this. This was in 19... 97. And, and someone else said, well, what is your connection to this story? And she said, my daughter is one of those girls. And she is still with the rebels now and had been for a year and a half. And I was, um, as Al was, as I'm sure everyone at the table was, was stunned by this story. But I think probably I think there were two things that particularly um, made it stick with me. And one was that I had been spending some time in, in Eastern Africa. I had friends in Kenya. I had been traveling back and forth there. So it wasn't Uganda, which is a neighboring country, wasn't a sort of unknown um, place on the other side of the planet. It was a place that I could kind of picture. Um, so I felt a sort of familiarity with it that way. And also, just something about hearing the story from this woman. I wasn't hearing it. I wasn't reading it in print. I was hearing it from her. And it was, needless to say, horrifying that this was going on. And here we were with some, I don't know, agency, one felt. And yet, across the other side of the world, there were these girls children, people with no agency, it seemed, whatsoever to, to fight um, this violent situation, which had gone on at that point for eight years and continued on for another 12 years. 20 years, this man, Joseph Coney, terrorized these people of the North. They were not um, really being paid attention to, needless to say, by the government, um, President Museveni. And it just sort of went on and on. So that was horrifying to me. I was returning to East Africa, so this was a, a, another reason. I thought, you know, this isn't usually the kind of thing I write about. Um, I, I do write nonfiction, but they're usually uh, more travel stories. It's not a kind of investigative reporting kind of thing. But I thought maybe I can write a story about this and um, convey the same kind of personal reaction I had to hearing the story at the dinner party. In other words, not go as a, a sort of journalist who is just reporting the facts out there, but to take it on a little more subjectively so that maybe someone hearing about it, reading about it, would experience it that way also. So I went the following winter. I traveled to the north. 
I interviewed um, the nun whose name is Sister Raquel Facera, who told me uh, what happened that night of the kidnapping. I interviewed a lot of children who had returned from the rebels. It's sort of such a slipshod operation that if, you know, someone goes off to the bathroom or if there's a little skirmish somewhere, a child is able to escape. Um, of course, the, the stakes are very high. If they escape and are, or try to escape and are caught, then they're killed, as an example, to the other children. So it's risky, but possible. So tens of thousands of children went through this kind of violent machine. And a lot of them, when they would return, would be placed in rehabilitation camps, which I say with sort of quotations, because there would be a couple of hundred children in the camp with all good intentions. They're drawing the pictures of what they'd been through and people with arms cut off and this sort of very um, childish renderings with sort of four or five people overseeing them. In other words, not getting a great deal of sort of therapeutic help. It was at least a step. So I, I talked to a lot of them. I returned back um, and I wrote a story. I wrote a nonfiction piece. It was slated to go in a magazine and at the same time a very similar story written by Elizabeth Rubin, who's a very good uh, journalist, came out in The New Yorker. And it started off with this kidnapping on the night of October 27th. So Harper's Magazine said we don't want. It ended up eventually getting published by um, Dave Eggers' McSweeney's Magazine. And it was the first time I had written something that I actually you know, sort of wanted to press into someone's hands. When I, I write novels, I, I write them in the spirit that I read other novels, which is it's something that comes my way. I experience it sort of privately. It's like a private dialogue with, with the author. And, um, but, but this had an extra, or at least the article had, a, had an extra reason to, um, for me to want to communicate it. There was this terrible thing going on. And I think it's safe to say maybe a few of my friends read it and that's horrible or whatever, but I did not hear a thing. And it was, you know, I thought, well, maybe this is just how it is, or do journalists ever hear anything back, or does one become an activist, or um, that was a little bit, a uh, little bit. It was very disappointing. But this was in 1998, and uh, but I continued on with my my fictional work. I moved to an island in Maine. I got married. I had a child. Different things happened. I wasn't traveling um, in Africa, and uh, eight years later, when I was sitting down to write, and I didn't write a book for a long time, I was raising a daughter. Um, I had different ideas for books, and these, the faces of these girls, the children that I had interviewed, were still like looming in front of my face. And I thought, maybe I can write a book that will really convey that experience more in my mode of, of fiction, which I have a little bit more of a handle on. And um, so I, I started that book, and I thought, I'm going to write a story of three of these girls. And to write about the violence they're subjected to is not really a very um, interesting subject for a novel. It's, it's a fact. It's, you can convey it in a paragraph you know, brutality. So that's not something to explore, really. So I, I ended up starting to explore what happens when people have been through a, a trauma like this, and, and how do people survive? And, and that's an interesting subject, because strong characters maybe don't really. Maybe they snap. And other people who seem like they're not going to bounce back, they do. So you know, 
if there's a grit in character, that's usually makes for um, more recovery than for other people. So I thought that would be interesting to write. Then I realized to follow three of these stories would maybe be a little too punishing for the reader. It's hard to read about, you know, uh, a woman finding her baby's arm cut off up in a tree. You know, you don't want to, you don't need to know about it endlessly. We can only sort of take so much. So I thought I'd focus on one girl, and in order to have a little bit of a, um, it's not even a relief, but, but something else going on in the book, I made this character of an American writer who's having a very different experience geographically, very close to where these terrible, evil things are going on, and to cut back and forth between the two characters. And as I did that, I realized that um, we have a, a sort of go-to, uh, a kind of a knee-jerk reaction to levels of sort of struggle and pain, and like there's a moral hierarchy of people's struggles. And certainly famine and war and natural disaster um, are, are higher stakes for, for people to be struggling with. But if your life is just this one and your struggles are these, they are no less valid than the more major um, high stakes struggles. So I started to sort of explore that in the book. That, that had not been my, my intention, but whenever um, I would say I write a book, I can start off thinking it's going to be about this and it will remain about that, but if, if thought goes into it at all, you start to explore different areas and different themes. And the more things you're exploring, hopefully the more rich the, the book is going to be. So um, seven years later, <laughs> I, I finished this book. So it was 15 years after that dinner party in New York City. Um, my, my trip in Africa was probably two, two and a half weeks. And then I, I spent, you know, five years later um, thinking about it sort of every day for seven years. So it's interesting how these little things can, can seize a, a hold of us and, and we can um, stay with them. So um, I'm going to read you from the beginning of the book about um, which focuses on the, the incident, which is taken very much from, from real life, though I've changed the names, and um, of the abduction of these girls. Sister Raquel in the book becomes Sister Julia, and she is She's caught up with the rebels the, the next day, as, as I've said. Sorry, I lost my place. This isn't my usual book. I've got to give it away to someone. Um, OK. They took small steps down the steep path, only immediately losing sight on the opposite slope. They've seen the girls from far away. They moved quickly, forgetting they were tired. Then a rebel looked down and saw her approaching and called out. She raised both hands up in the air, and behind her, a teacher would come with her, did the same. Other rebels were now looking over. She knew at least she would not be mistaken for an inf informant or army soldier. Then she saw the girls catch sight of her. A large man walked down from higher up and stopped to watch her coming. He had yellow braid on his green shirt, a hat with a brim, and no gun. He shouted to his soldiers to allow her to approach, and Sister Julia made her way up the hill to where he waited with large arms folded. She saw her girls out of the corner of her eye, gathered now beneath a tree, 
and instinct told her not to look in their direction. I am Captain Mariana Laguira, he said. She introduced herself. I have come for my girls, said Sister Julia. Captain Laguira smiled. Where were you last night? I was not there, she said. It was a small lie. I had to take a sick nun to Lyra. She slipped her backpack off and took out the brown bag. Here, I have money. Mariana Laguira took the paper bag and looked inside. We don't want money, he handed the bag to a rebel who nevertheless carried it away. Follow me, he said. I will give you your girls. She felt a great lifting in her heart. The guard, there was a guard beside him who looked no older than 12. He wore a necklace of bullets and had hard eyes. She followed Laguira and passed close to some girls and began to greet them, but they remained looking down. She noticed that one rebel dressed in camouflage had a woman's full bosom. Captain Laguira pointed to a log with a plastic bag on it. Sit here, she sat. What have you there? My rosary, she said. I am praying. Laguira fished into the pocket of his pants and pulled out a string of brown beads. Look, he said. I pray too. The rebels are sort of a mishmash of religions. They bow to Mecca, but they also sort of smear their body with oil and then bullets don't hit you, or there's a certain rock you can lift up and you'll turn into a mountain so no one can harm you, and you know, don't eat white chickens on Friday, and there's a lot of you know, cult-like stuff going on there too. They both knelt down and the rebels around them watched as the nun and the captain prayed together. It was long past noon now and the air was still. When they finished praying, Sister Julia dared to ask him, will you give me my girls? He looked at her. Perhaps he was thinking. Please, she said, let them go. This is a decision for Coney, he said. Coney was their leader. They called themselves the Lord's Resistance Army, that was never clear to her exactly what they were resisting. Museveni's government, she supposed, though that was based in the South, and rebel activities remained limited to looting villages and kidnapping children in the North. So they, they walk for a while and come to another little area where um, Captain Laguira um, says, you, why don't you go and and let's have tea. Captain Laguira wanted to know would she join him for tea and biscuits. She would not refuse. A young woman in a wrapped skirt came out from the hut carrying a small stump for S Sister Julia to sit on. It was possible this was one of his wives, though he did not greet her. At the edge of the doorway, she saw a hand and half of a face looking out. The woman went into the hut and after some time returned with a tray and mugs and a box of English biscuits. They drank their tea. Sister Julia was hungry, but she did not eat a biscuit. I ask you again, she said, will you give me my girls? She did not phrase it as a question. Do not worry, he smiled. I am Mariano Laguira. He put down his mug. Now you go and wash. Another girl appeared, this one a little younger, with bare feet and small pearl earrings. She led Sister Julia behind the hut to a basin of water and a plastic shower bag hanging from a tree. She must have been another wife. Sister Julia washed her hands and face. She washed her feet and cleaned the blisters she'd gotten from her wet sneakers. She returned to Mariano. The rebel commander was now Mariano to her, as if a friend. He still sat on his stool holding a stick and scratching in the dirt by his feet. She glanced toward the girls and saw that some of them had moved to a separate place to the side. Mariano didn't look up when he spoke. There are 139 girls, he said, and traced the number in the dirt. That many, she thought, saying nothing, more than half the school. I give you, he wrote the number by his boot as he said, 109, and I, he scratched another number, keep 30. Sister Julia looked toward the girls with alarm. There was a large group on the left and a smaller group on the right. While she was washing, they had been divided. She knelt down in front of Mariano. No, she said. 
They are my girls. Let them go and keep me instead. Only Kony decides these things. Then let me speak with Kony. No one ever saw Kony. He was hidden over the border in Sudan. Maybe the government troops couldn't reach him there. Maybe, as some thought, President Museveni did not try so hard to find him. The North was not such a priority for Museveni, and neither was the LRA. There were government troops around, yes, but the LRA was not so important. Let the girls go and take me to Kony. You can ask him, he said and shrugged. Did he mean it? You can write him a note. Captain Laguerre called, and a woman with a white shirt and ragged pink belt was sent to another hut to return eventually with a pencil and a piece of paper. Sister Julia leaned the paper on her knee and wrote, Dear Mr. Coney, please be so kind as to allow Captain Mariana Laguerre to release the girls of a bouquet. Yours in God, Sister Julia DeAngelis. As she wrote each letter, she felt her heart sink down. Coney would never see this note. You go write the names of the girls over there, he said. She looked at the smaller group of girls sitting in feathery shadows. Please, Mariano, she said. You do like this, or you will have none of the girls, said Captain Mariano Laguerre. She left the captain and went over to the girls sitting on the hard ground. She held the pencil and paper limply in her hand. The girls looked at her, each with meaning in her eyes. She bent down to speak, girls, be good, but she couldn't finish her sentence. The girls started to cry. They understood everything. An order was shouted, and suddenly some rebels standing nearby were grabbing branches and hitting at the girls crying. One jumped on the back of Louise. She saw them slap Janet. Then the girls became quiet. Sister Julia didn't know what to do. Then it seemed as if they were all talking to her at once, in low voices, whispering. No, not all. Some were just looking at her. Please, they were saying, sister, take me. Jessica said, I have been hurt. Another, my brothers died in a car accident and my mother is sick. Charlotte said, sister, I have asthma. Sister, I am in my period. Sister Julia looked back at the captain standing with his arms crossed. He was shaking his head. She said she was supposed to write their names, but she was unable. Louise, the captain of the football team, took the pencil from her in the paper and started to write, Akello, Esther, Ochiti, Agnes, Judith, Helen, Janet, Lily, Jessica, Charlotte, Louise, Jacqueline. She returned to the commander. Did I mistreat you, sister? No, sir. Did I mistreat the girls? No, sir. So next time I come to the school, do not run away, the captain laughed. Would the sister like more tea and biscuits? No, thank you. They bade each other goodbye. It was as if they might have been old friends. You may go greet the girls before you leave, Mariana Laguerre said. Sister Julia returned over to the 30 girls, her 30 girls, who would not be coming with her. She gave her rosary to Judith and said, look after them. She handed Jessica her own sweater out of the backpack. When we go, you must not look at us, she said. No, sister, we won't. Then a terrible thing happened. Catherine whispered, sister, it's Agnes. She has gone just over there. Sister Julia saw Agnes standing back with the larger group of girls gathered to leave. You must get her, Sister Julia said. She couldn't believe she was having to do this. If they see one is missing, so Agnes was brought back. She was at least holding a pair of sneakers. She was told she might be endangering the others. Okay, Agnes said. I will not try to run away again. Sister Julia had to make herself turn to leave. Helen called after her sister. You are coming back for us? Sister Julia left with the large group of girls. They walked away into the new freedom of the same low trees and scruffy grasses, which now had a new appearance, and left the 30 others behind. Bosco, 
the teacher led the way, and Sister Julia walked in the middle. Some girls walked beside her and held her hand for a while. They bowed their heads when she passed near them. Arriving at a road, they all turned onto it. The rebels stayed off the roads. It grew dark, and they kept walking. They came to a village that was familiar to some of them and stopped at two houses to spend the night. There were more than 50 girls to each house, so many lay outside sleeping close in one another's arms. Sister Julia felt she was awake all night, but then somehow her eyes were opening, and it was dawn. At 5 a.m., they fetched water and continued footing at home. As the birds started up, they saw they were closer to the school and found that word had been sent ahead, and in little areas passed people who clapped as they went by. Sister Julia felt some happiness in the welcome, but inside there was distress. They came finally to their own road and at last to the school drive. Across the field, Sister Julia caught sight of the crowd of people near the gate. The parents were all there waiting. She saw the chapel blackened behind the purple bougainvillea, but the tower above still standing. Many girls ran out to embrace their mothers who were hurrying to them. As she got close, Sister Julia saw the parents' faces watching, the parents looking for their daughters. They searched the crowd. There was Jessica's mother with her hand holding her throat. She saw Louise's mother, Grace, ducking side to side, studying the faces of the girls. The closer they got to the gate, the more the girls were engulfed by their families, and the more separated became the adults whose children were not there. These families held each other and kept their attention away from the parents whose girls had been left behind. They would not meet their gaze. In this way, those parents learned their children had not made it back. When they came near Sister Julia and all the commotion, she turned away from them. She was answering other questions. Some mothers were kneeling in front of her, some kissed her hand. She was thinking, though, only of the other parents. And she would talk to them eventually, but just now it seemed impossible to face them. Then she wondered if she'd be able to face anyone again, ever. Thank you. We have time for one question. I know that, that after that, no one feels like really chatting a lot, you know? It's, uh, but Susan will be available to sign the books, which you may have written at the tent right behind you. Is the LRA still operative? You know, barely. It's, um, they're not even sure where it is. It's either in Congo um, and Actually, the, uh, you know, the, the girls who were um, taken from the school in Nigeria, um, it's a, a very different operation, Boko Haram, who took them. But they, they actually did pick up a few tips from the LRA. So there were, um, we had some government troops um, still in Uganda now, but in the last couple of years, who were still looking for Kony, even though his, he's, he's left Uganda, he was in Rwanda for a while, he was in Congo, he's you know, apparently a little sick, or different rumors come back. Every once in a while, a sort of officer or someone who was very active in it um, turns himself in. Um, but some of those American um, officers that had been studying the LRA for a long time were brought to Nigeria to try to advise. Um, I, I think that all sort of crumbled and fell apart for various other reasons. But So he's not, um, not really is the answer, you know. Yes, but there's a positive story, yes. There's a positive story now. There's an organization. Oh my goodness. 
<laughs> There's an organization called UMEX, and I'm afraid I can't remember what the United Movement to End Child Soldiering. United Movement to End Child Soldiering. It's run by an American man, lawyer from Springfield, Mass, named Art Sirota. And he has established in the northern province, formerly of the LRA, uh, five or six schools and leading to university where the former child soldiers and kidnappees uh, go and get a, a degree and go on to university. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary story. But the part that fits is that he led a group of mothers to the LRA to beg for their children back. And that whole story um, of courage and risk and compassion is not also not told uh, here. And he's an American and deserves a lot of support. So the it's it's told a little bit in the book um, of the of the uh, the parents who actually this woman Angelina started an organization called which with with a very subtle title I thought. Um, <laughs> Concerned Parents Association, <laughs> and these are they were the parents of the children who had had been abducted, and they formed that very quickly after the abduction of the girls of Aboke, and um, in fact she did a, a rather heroic, some say quite baffling thing. She did meet with. Um, some of the LRA commanders, and they said, you know, you're giving us a lot of trouble. Like, your people are listening to you. She traveled to Washington. We'll give you back your daughter if you stop talking. And she said no. Wow. They teach peace education in these schools, which is so wonderful. OK, I guess I'm going over to the tent. Thanks so much. It's really nice of you to all come. <laughs>